Hello, everyone, and welcome to our talk about model deployment in GAMS. My name is Robin Schuchmann, and together with my colleague, Frederik Proske, we will talk about GAMS Miro today. So what is GAMS Miro? With GAMS Miro, this is a deployment tool which allows you to easily turn your GAMS models into fully interactive end user applications. And when you use a Miro application, you don't need to get in contact with any GAMS code at all. You can feed the model with input data in a very convenient way using tables or other widgets like sliders, drop down menus, checkboxes, and many more. And the data of your model runs can be visualized with a wide range of charting tools. Also, Miro offers very helpful tools for the comparison of scenarios. A deployed Miro app is a self contained platform independent file which you can easily share with others. And when using Miro on your local computer, you can use your personal Miro library to access all deployed apps in one place. And since GAMS Miro is based on web technology, it runs on any modern web browser. And this has the advantage that a Miro application cannot only be used on your local computer, but also you can host Miro applications on a server and access them from everywhere. We call this setup Miro Server, which I will explain in more detail at the end of this talk. Now I want to give you a brief introduction uh, to the data concept of GAMS Miro. So the basic idea is that in the GAMS model, the user provides an annotation to define symbols that are exposed to the user in the app, such that she or he can edit and analyze them. For input symbols that you want to see in the Miro app, you can use the tags dollar on external input and dollar off external input. And all symbols that are declared between these tags will be visible in your Miro application. And for output data, you can use the tags dollar on external output and dollar off external output in a similar fashion. Now, when you run a Miro application, the first thing that happens is that you load data into the Miro interface. These data can either come from Miro's internal database or from external data sources such as Excel or GDX files, or you do manual edits. Then when clicking on solve, the data is sent to the GAMS model and all data of affected symbols in the, uh, in the model will be overwritten. Symbols that are not visible in Miro are also not touched in the model. Then the model is run with the updated data and afterwards, the results are sent back to Remo, uh, Miro and displayed in the output section. And from there, the data can be saved in the internal database again, or it can be exported or analyzed. With Miro, we focus on the automated deployment of GAMS models. We call this the configuration instead of programming approach. The basic idea of the Miro app development is that you can create your first simple prototype within minutes and then develop it step by step until yeah, it meets your requirements. And for this, no programming knowledge is required. The focus is rather on providing a wide range of configuration options. And if these configuration options are not sufficient for you, you can implement your own ideas using custom code. So. A typical workflow for the Miro app development looks like this. Due to this configuration instead of programming approach, you can get a working application very fast. And by using Miro's data visualization and analysis facilities, such a prototype is also suitable for debugging the GAMS model. And since it's very easy to share an app with others, you can give away this prototype for testing, get feedback, and continue working. And typically, you don't do this once, but also a second time, sometimes a third or a fourth time. So this rapid prototyping enables the app developer to get results quickly, which enables the end user to really try out the application at an early stage of development. And this results in more efficient feedback loops. All right, now let's have a look at the Miro application. The GAMS model for this application comes from the agricultural sector. And basically, this model helps a farmer to decide how to allocate his or her land. Consider a European farmer who specializes in raising wheat, corn, and sugar beets on his 
500 acres of land. During the winter, he wants to decide how much land to devote to each crop. Now the farmer knows that a yeah, certain amount of wheat and corn are needed for cattle feed. These amounts can be raised on the farm or bought from a wholesaler. And any production in excess of the feeding requirement uh, will be sold. A very profitable crop is sugar beet, which the farmer expects to sell at a high price. However, the European Commission imposes a quota on sugar beet production. Any amount in excess of the quota can be sold only at, le, uh, at a very low price. This model describes a stochastic problem. The farmer has experienced quite different yields for the same crop over different years, mainly because of uh, changing weather conditions. And with this, I hand over the microphone and also the screen to my colleague, Frederick Proske, who will show you this app in a brief live demo. Thank you, Robin, and welcome also from my side. Um, so this is how the Miro application looks like uh, for the model that Robin just described. We have a brief introduction here in the form of a readme. Um, this basically describes the model and as well as how the app works and how to use it. And then we have some tabular data for, for our crops, as well as the price curve that Robin described previously. Um, uh, and here you see this uh, quota that Robin talked about that for sugar beets, uh, there is this curve section S1 that basically limits the amount of sugar beets that we can sell for a price of 36 euro to 6,000 and everything above that is sold for, for just 10 euro per ton. And then we also have a bunch of input widgets that are basically scalars um, that we can use to um, modify the model. And two scalars in particular that I want to uh, put your attention on is the yield factor, uh, as well as the standard deviation. So we, the stochasticity of this model uh, comes entirely from these two scalars. Um, in particular, we sample the yield factor based on a normal distribution with a mean of, in this case, one, or the yield factor in general, as well as a standard deviation that we can modify. And then if we were to run this model, Miro informs of the, us that we have already solved this before, but let's just solve it again and quickly run this. And once the results are back, you will see that we have some visualization of our results here. Um, these are our input settings, and let's quickly look at the yield factor realization, where you see our normal distribution, uh, based mainly the realizations of the samples we produced. And then here on the left side, you see the profit of the different scenarios also uh, plotted. And if we look at the cost, we see that quite a lot of uh, scenarios result in a cost between 113 to 114,000 euro per uh, euro, as, but there are also some outliers that uh, result in much higher cost. And now we want to run a little um, sensitivity analysis by modifying the yield factor. So what we do is we go to our input section, but instead of just solving a single scenario, we want to solve what we call a hypercube job. So we click on this submit hypercube tab, and now you see that all the sliders that you've seen previously were extended to uh, slider ranges. And our uh, drop-down menu is now extended to a multi-drop-down menu. And this allows us to um, quickly solve a whole batch of scenarios at once. And so for our demo here, let's just uh, say that we want to um, vary the standard deviation of our yield factor between 0 and 0 0.8. And since we don't want to solve 80 scenarios here, let's increase this uh, step size here uh, to 0 0.05 so that we um, get 16 scenarios. And in order to easily find our scenarios later, we assign some tags to the job. Um, let's, let me put SD for standard deviation and 160 scenarios um, that we want to sample and then submit this hypercube job. And so 
what Miro does behind the scenes is it hands over this model to our GAMS execution engine that we call engine. And engine solves this hypercube job now. And once it's finished, we'll return the results back in Miro. And if we go to our job list here, we can see that it's already completed. We can download the results and import them back into Miro. And so once that's finished, we go to load these scenarios in order to compare them. And so uh, we can use the tags we specified previously. We say that we want to filter our database based on this SD tag. We load all the results and see that we get our 16 scenarios back. We choose all of them. And because Miro chose some random names for these scenarios, uh, which we can not easily see what scenario name belongs to which standard deviation, we can instruct Miro to name the scenarios based on our standard deviation, which makes it easy to compare them. Let's bring them into the Miro comparison mode. And let's look at our financial report here. Um, and you can see all the data for the scenario with a standard deviation of zero. Uh, all the different realizations, as well as cost, profit, and revenue here. Um, let's first aggregate over the scenarios and say we are only interested in the mean um, over each of the realizations. And for the report, we are only interested in the profit report. And let's plot this as a line chart. And then we can see that in this general downward trend of our profits, as we would expect um, when we have higher uh, standard deviations so higher uh, amount of uncertainty and last but not least let's also look at our um, crop allocation so what crops we decide to plant for that we go to the crop report and we bring up the crops into the uh, columns here and let's also filter based on what we planted so the crops we planted and again, let's use a line chart for visualization purposes. And you see that uh, the higher the uncertainty, the more uh, wheat we decide to plant and the less sugar beets, which again goes back to this, um, um, uh, this cost function that is sort of this, this, this quota that is imposed that even if we have a yield factor much higher than one, uh, we can only sell the excess amount above the 6,000 for a much lower price, which uh, is not profitable um, for us. And with that, I hand back to Robin to talk a little bit of the different setups of Miro. Okay, so thank you. Um, let's continue with the Miro setups. So uh, on this slide, you see the different setups that are possible with Miro. The first one is called Miro Desktop. So GAMS Miro can be used together with GAMS both as local applications. So Miro is installed locally, GAMS is installed locally. Um, yeah, this is the first setup. The next one is a hybrid of a local application that performs model calculations in the cloud. So GAMS Miro is installed locally but the GAMS jobs are sent to GAMS engine, which runs in the cloud. And um, then it's also possible to put a Miro application onto a server uh, without much effort. And with Miro server, you can run the application in the cloud and access it from everywhere via computer, a tablet, smartphone, and so on. And in this setup, no software or license is needed on a local computer anymore. Besides the benefits of making apps easily accessible for others, the central hosting of Miro apps also brings other as aspects into focus. So there is the asynchronous solving. So you can submit jobs and log back in later to get the results as Freddie just showed you. Um, you can even share scenarios. So you can share scenarios of your Miro application with other users of your Miro application from within the app. Then Miro server also comes with a user and group management, meaning you can map the structures of your work environment by dividing users into groups with different, um, um, yeah, with different privileges. You can decide which user can add new apps or who has control over deleting apps and stuff like that. And last but not least, the, the, the app updates uh, since Miro server and also GAMS engine um, are based on Docker technology. You can 
update Miro apps without the risk of interrupting running applications. This already brings us to the end of our talk. To sum this up, um, some aspects that we consider very useful when using Miro are first, with Miro, you can have a better commu uh, communication between OR experts and end users through faster and more efficient feedback loops, as I explained earlier. So you get quick first results by rapid prototyping, which can be a good basis for further developments. And through the easy to use Miro app and its data visualization, the model is directly accessible and also usable uh, for the end user. So the user can give better feedback through this hands-on experience. And for the app developer, there is no knowledge in web development necessary for these steps. You, you can get the first results by only configuring uh, the application instead of programming anything. And for highly customized, uh, yeah, full-fledged application, there's a wide range of possibilities by uh, writing custom code. Next thing is that through Games Miro server, you can make applications available to a group of people even better. And last but not least, even though this is a web application, it is suitable for large amounts of data. And by large, I mean millions of data records, which is often necessary in the field of OR. And this is possible thanks to a balanced distribution of server and uh, client resources. And with this, I conclude this talk. You can find more information on our website. Thank you very much for listening.